What's up, everybody? Doug here with Leaving the Dream. Thanks for coming out. Sorry, I had to restart the video. I got people joining in on TikTok and on YouTube. Shout out to my Patreon, all you guys, for all your support. You guys are the best. So, today we're going to be talking about drugs in Hawaii. For those of you who live in Hawaii, you get the drug problem in Hawaii. You understand it. You've seen it. You've heard about it. For those of you who are off-island or on the mainland, maybe only visited Hawaii, that might be new to you. You may have only remember seeing the homeless population, or you might have had your car broken into, or those kind of things. But for those of us who lived in Hawaii or live in Hawaii currently or are from Hawaii, you guys get it. The drug problem in Hawaii is real. What's up, Manny, on YouTube? Whoa, what's up, everybody, on TikTok? Thanks for coming through. Appreciate you guys. Mark that bag says, mean to dope. Scott F., Flying Hawaiian, Brandon White. What's up, guys? Thanks for coming through. Appreciate you. Um, give a shout-out to all my Patreons. You guys are the best. Tamara, Bobby, Michelle, Leigh, Christina, Nans, Shiloh, Grant, Luana, Britt, Pamela, Kanoi, Daniel D., Whitney G., Bredge, Tyra, Kai, DK, Pam, Marissa, Cynthia, Mary, Marissa K., Big Jens, Chang, Aaron, Layton, X. Chan, Rekka Forever, Terry Bear, Danielle Carroll, Gina, Big H. And there's a few more of you that I'll get on that. Um, that I didn't put down on the list yet, but I'll catch you on my next video. I just want to say thank you for the Patreon support. You guys are the best. Couldn't do it without you. We've been having a blast with the book, Sunny Sky Shady Characters, that I got right here. Um, we should have read Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. The new video comes out Monday. Don't forget to check that out. 2300 hours. It's 11 p.m. Hawaii time. I'm sorry, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Hawaii time. Go check it out if you want to get down. We're having a blast with that. Uh, this last week's um, video was awesome had fun a lot of people put in their input and what their lives are like how they're related to the organized crime problem in hawaii so go check it out okay so um brandon white says officer jeff f said next time i catch you live tell i said what's up dougie jeff is one of the coolest dudes you ever meet he's a great officer too we need more officers like him hello miss honu what's up reno Reno's pops. Um, Scott I, Scott F said ice problem. Yeah, that's I guess you could put it lightly. Scott F says where's the drugs come from? China. Well, I'm sure some drugs come from China, and it's interesting you say that because that's where meth first came from to the islands. And one small fact that people might not know is that before ice made it to the mainland, it made it to Hawaii. There was a judge that used to I used to pick up a lot of warrants from. So a lot of the guys that arrested on their high bill warrants. The judge that um, issued those warrants, he once said that that Hawaii's gift to the mainland was crystal meth because it came here first from Asia. And uh, it hit here in about the 80s. But I'm going to get into that. Why oh, what's up? Thanks for uh, coming through, checking in. What's up, Jovan? Appreciate you guys. <laughs> Too much swag. 808 says, love story time with Dougie. 100. <laughs> Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate you guys. Uh, make that back said, I think this arrested me in Waikiki. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised, bro. It wasn't personal. Uh, and George Miley, Georgie Miley says, I used to run the Hawaii Meth Project. No way. Wow, dude. We were going to talk about the Hawaii Meth Project. I often reference when I first moved here, when I first moved to Hawaii in 2007, there was, a, I think it was 2007, it might have been when I moved the second time in 2011, there was that commercial, Not Even Once. That was the slogan. And, uh, dude, that's, that's how it should be. Ice is so special because it hooks you right away. It's like the first time... You're done. I don't know many people that smoked ice and then didn't never smoked it again. I don't know many people that only smoked ice once, put it that way. So, um, 
let me just get into it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly talk about, you know, the drug problem in Hawaii as a whole, because that's pretty shocking. Um, it's not, I think people think that Hawaii's got a problem just like the mainland or Hawaii's got the problem like any other, any other state, but it is so much deeper and bigger in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is like number one in a few categories of the entire country. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But um, meth has meth has destroyed our local communities. And um, the ratio of local and native populations in Hawaii and Polynesia are greater with meth addiction um, than people who were born off island. And it's devastating the local communities in Hawaii. So I'm just going to rattle off a few things that I thought were interesting. I did a lot of research. There will be links in the description to these videos. Probably not right now during my live stream, but I'll put them in there for the video to be watched later. Um, I do have a link up here in the beginning for if you know you or somebody you know is addicted to drugs and is looking for some help. There are some resources out there for you. Hawaii actually has a lot of resources, um, so I would take advantage of that. Okay, so the types of drugs in Hawaii. This is going to come from my perspective as an ex-cop. So these are the drugs that I ran into when I was out on the beat dealing with people. Hundreds of people that I've arrested or come in contact with that were addicted to drugs. And I will say that there was a very, very small population of people that I've ever had to arrest. I mean, I could probably count them on two hands that I arrested and they were not doing drugs. Like, that drugs are not a part of their life. I could count them on two hands, maybe on one hand. Most people that I've ever arrested were either on drugs at the time or in the middle of struggling with drugs or were in the situation that they were in due to the drugs that they dealt with. Um, one thing I will say is Hawaii has actually a low occurrence of opioid abuse. It's rising, but... I remember when I started at the police department, maybe like a year on the beat, when I was like a year on patrol, 2012-ish, I started getting a lot of heroin overdose calls. A lot of them in Makiki, a lot of them up like by Green and Wilder and the bottom of the mountain. Um, I was getting a lot of ODs. And um, I remember thinking, I remember going to two in one day and thinking, wow, this is getting crazy. And so I would talk to the people that were involved, right? Like, it'd be one person who OD'd in their room, but they shared the room with other people, and I'd talk to other people, and they'd give me, like, hints and pointers as to, like, what's going on in Hawaii with heroin, which is the main opioid that's been, that has been that gets used. There are other opo opioids that people use. There's codeine. Everybody knows about codeine. Codeine you could find, it's really easy to find in syrup, um, in cough medicine, basically. They do the codeine with omeprazine. I think I forget what they call it. Um, and people just drink it. They put it in the cup. It's called syrup, scissor, lean, perp. And I think it's like two out of every ten kids right now in Hawaii have drank and syrup, have drank syrup to abuse it like a drug. But we got codeine. There's fentanyl, which is growing in Hawaii and killing a lot of people. Hydrocodone. There's Vicodin, which is like a hydrocodone mixed with acetaminophen. There's methadone. Methadone is big. There's that clinic um, downtown by Central Middle School. Um, right at the top of, what is that? Queen Emma. Or maybe um, Alakea. And then there's heroin. Most of the time, when I dealt with people that were using these opioids, it was heroin. They didn't start off with heroin. Most people didn't start off with heroin, but it starts somewhere else. I can't tell you how many times I caught people smoking oxys. That was a big one. Sometimes people call it chasing the bean. It sounds like a stupid name, but it's basically... They would take like this little tray of... Picture a little square of... Um, aluminum foil like the size of a gum wrapper like a piece of a gum wrapper and they'll have that foil and they would take the piece of oxy and they would put the pill on the foil and then they heat it up from the bottom 
And as they heat it up, the pill starts to melt. There's this plastic coating on oxys that would melt. And as it would melt, it would slide. So they would tilt the foil and they're heating it up from the bottom and the pill would start to slide down. And as it slid, it created this like slimy patch. Picture like a slug moving across the sidewalk and leaving that slime. Oxy would melt and leave that slime. And as you kept heating it, it would turn to smoke. So they'd have a, they'd have like a straw and they'd just breathe it in and they'd smoke their oxys. Um, most of the time it started because they took oxys for like a surgery or something like that. Somebody gave them a, uh, an oxy to use and most of the time it turns into smoking it. The reason why they smoke it is because oxy is designed to be slow release. So when you take the, the pill, it's coated with this plastic essentially. And the plastic slowly melts away with water, like water will dissolve it. So you take it and it, it's a slow time release. But if you smoke it, it gets sucked up by the alveoli at the bottom of the lungs, and it's a lot faster high. Um, you could also snort it, which is like instantly to the bloodstream. Because normally if you pop it, then it goes through your liver and your all your digestive system. So it cleans out a lot of the bad stuff. But if you smoke it or snort it, it goes right to the bloodstream. And so people would start taking the pill, but it was slow release, so they needed a bigger hit. So they'd start smoking it or crushing it and snorting it. And that would be like a bigger high. But eventually what happens is that gets expensive. Oxy pills can be expensive, like 30, 60 bucks a pill. So after a while, you're like, if you don't have a plug, if you don't got somebody that's giving you those pills, or grandma has, you know, 100 pills in the medicine cabinet or whatever, then basically you got to look for another alternative. So that's why people are stealing and lying and taking from their parents and selling stuff. And that usually happened. But eventually what happens with Oxy or any opiate that starts off with that same kind of pill, taking the pill, smoking the pill, snorting the pill. Sometimes people even slam it. But you got to have money if you're slamming Oxy. Like that's expensive. Oxy is an opiate. That's what heroin is. So eventually... People go to heroin because it's cheaper. So there's tons of people using heroin. I think I got some numbers here. Let me see. 67,000 drug overdoses in the U.S. annually in 2018. 70% of them were opioids. 10% of them were fentanyl or other synthetics. Um, in Hawaii, there was 59 overdoses in 2018. 1,200 public school students, that's 2.8%. That means, that means three out of every hundred admitted to injecting illegal drugs. That's three out of every hundred in public high school. 2,000 middle school students say they've been injected. This was in a 2018 survey. I don't know how legit it is. But I, I'm going to leave the um, links for all these things that I'm talking about. What a trip, man. Can you believe it? But considering all that, Hawaii is the lowest rate of prescription opioids in any state in the U.S. 33 of 100 people. I'm sorry. 33 people. 33 pills for every... 100 people. So 33 prescriptions for every 100 people. 100 people, 33 of them have prescriptions for opioids. And in Hawaii, about 2,000, they're estimating that 2,000 people are addicted to heroin in Hawaii. 2,000. That's crazy. That's like a population of an entire school somewhere. What a trip. And then you got other ones. You got some of the other drugs that aren't as big of a problem as, say, meth. Let me get to some of these. Oh, Jovan Lopez, $5. Thank you, bro. Man, you're awesome. You're always coming through with the gifts, my man. I appreciate you, dude. Thank you so much. Okay, on... Let me see. On TikTok. 
It's David. It's David. Aloha from the Ninth Island. This dude's in Vegas. Le Raposo. What's up, Le? Thanks for coming through. Georgie says, black tar heroin. Yeah. So, eventually what happens is when people are done with the pills, they go to heroin. And we talked about this before. There's there's white heroin that they call white boy. And then there's black tar heroin. And people will snort or smoke boy. But that creates some problems that we'll get into. And then most people will just melt down black tar and, and shoot it. And we call it slamming. So they'll slam it. So if anyone's slamming drugs, that means they're injecting them. And the needle that they use, they call a rig. Typically in Hawaii, they call them a rig. So if they... One dude would ask another, like, you got a rig? You got a clean rig? There's, like, needle exchange programs. You know what's messed up? There was, for a while there, there were needle exchange programs right at Makiki Park. You know where Makiki Park is? Like, right on that side street on the Cocoa Head Street of Makiki Park, where there's that bathroom. A van, a white van would pull up and do needle exchanges at the park. So you would have drug dealers that, or not drug dealers, drug users that would want to wait. They're waiting because they want clean needles. I get it. But it was by a park. And I remember my son had soccer at that park one day. And I was watching his game. I was I was actually on duty that day. Pulled up my blue and white. Could see them playing. And it just so happened to be on my beat. So I was just there making sure it was all good. And I saw the van pull up. And I remember tripping out that this needle exchange van was there and I got kids. So when I pull up on the side, I get on my car and I start walking and there's all these heroin addicts sitting in the cars. And it was like, man, it messed me up because I knew that that was a big heroin bathroom. I knew a lot of people were using that bathroom for heroin because I would find the rigs because I usually would work at night. I happened to be doing like overtime during the day or something <sighs> and just tripped me out. So I knew heroin was growing, but apparently the last couple of years, it's fallen like 2% a year, something like that. So supposedly getting better. Georgie says, I used to smoke heroin and meth like that on foil. No way. Okay, back to the YouTube. Tony Ho'olulu. Tony Ho'olulu. Um, said mid to late 80s. Yeah, so the mid to late 80s is when meth first made it over to Hawaii. Gotham Jr. said, I stay Miley right now and just seen Chronic's f friends fighting and cops pulled up. They was panicking, but still arguing. It's chronic action all over Hawaii. What's up, Tafi Sao? Too much swag, 808. Come back, run for office. Oh, no. I don't want that gonna get sucked in like everybody else did ice was originally by Japanese cause soldiers had very little food originally herb was called mahuang Japanese condensed it and became popular used in cold and flu meds no way why ya all spitting facts uh, Eileen Lee says weed is happening in Hawaii yeah so the reason why I'm not I'm not gonna talk about marijuana is for obvious reasons like the legality of it it's not that big a deal anymore is what it is that's just how it is Le Ilima Raposo said she switched from TikTok to YouTube right on Le at least you're here Promethazine that's what it is too much swag 808 said Promethazine so it's usually codeine and Promethazine um, is usually the mixture of syrup Remember time where paint and glue sniffing was a problem. Got so bad stores had to lock up glues and paints. They're still locked up, glues and paints. You still got to be 18 to buy a can of spray paint. Yeah, they don't sell liquid NyQuil at 7-Eleven because they're just going to steal them. Yeah. What's up, Goo? Toffee Sal said, back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was one of them that was on ice. I had to make a life-changing decision for the well-being and future of my kids. I left home one day and never looked back. Congratulations, Toffee. Thank you for telling me that. It's so good to hear that because I never hear those. I'm telling you, I've met one, maybe two people in my life that smoked ice and got away from it. That were full-blown chronic and turned their life around. 
I've only met one or two my whole life. And it's discouraging when I see people smoking ice because I know the chances of them breaking is so low. Not one Batu. Not even once. Yep, Kaoloa's brother. Remember the doctor. She had her hands on that Dougie. Remember that, bro? Yep, I remember that. I'm, I wonder what was... Do you remember what they were selling? I forget what Kaoloa's brother was selling. It was prescription pills, but it was probably Oxy. Probably was. Thank you, Jovan. He said a snack. I'll buy something tomorrow. I appreciate you, bro. Kevin Anderson said, I lived Eva Beach 72 to 74. It was all about the glue. Yao said, Beetle nut, another drug, but people don't realize true beetle nut is illegal. False beetle nut, just caffeine. Yeah, I saw tons of, hey, true story, check this out. On the beetle nut issue. So we'd arrest guys all the time that had beetle nut on them. And it's literally a beetle nut. It's like this, they're like nuts in, in a bag. And I remember one day we arrested one guy on Kenow at the ward off. So, you know, you're, getting, you're heading um, Cocoa Head on H1, take the ward off, and it goes up to Kenow. It's a Kenow off, sorry. It's a Kenow off. Take the Kenow off, but then it goes right to ward. So, at the Kenow off, right where you come down and make the turn and get those yellow bumper 50-gallon drums with the graffiti on them. Well, right past that is a... It's like a liquor store and it was like a micronesian liquor store there was mostly micronesians hanging around for whatever reason because i think there's a micronesian like unit and we stopped some dudes oh there was a stabbing some kids got stabbed or something crazy happened anyway we arrested somebody and when we arrested him he had thrown his bag of beetle nut on our hood like to set it down when we put his hands on the hood to search him he was going to go to jail and at some point, I don't know if someone forgot the beetle nut or whatever. On like, I don't think maybe one, none of us saw them throw it on the hood. And we drove away and it must have like slid off or something. It was like a plastic bag uh, with beetle nut. Anyway, we would share our cars with other officers. So we worked nighttime, but the daytime, uh, we worked in the ATV unit. So nighttime was ATVs. Daytime, a different unit would use our car because we weren't using it. So a different unit would use our car. And I'll never forget um, the officers who used that next car. They were like, they left me a note the next day. said, hey, try to be more careful next time. And took like a photo and set the photo on, uh, on the steering wheel of the hood. And the hood looked like it had blood on it. Apparently, beetle nut looked like blood when it's dried. And they they weren't sure what had happened. But it totally looked like blood on the top of the car but it was beetle nut juice from that beetle nut it was like dark so that was my first experience of beetle nut i never really knew what it was but apparently they chew it with lye with lime and it it you know that stone and it cuts their gums so that when they chew on them it gets right into the blood isn't that a trip anybody ever chewed beetle nut Tommy Kailua said, do the math per capita more OD than LA, really? Dang. Zachary, Tago Vailoa. More kids are doing more drugs these days because of the music they listen to, not just that, but parents aren't as strict as it was back in the days. This generation is getting soft. Also, Zachary, there's more drugs available. There just is more drugs available. So it's easier to get people working more in Hawaii because it's getting so expensive. John Mitchell, you're doing good things. Aloha. Aloha, John. Thanks for coming in, man. Tommy Kailua said, Puna Needle Exchange, largest in the nation. Dang. Daniel D. said, I didn't know you used to b-boy. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna get back to this real quick and I'll catch up on some of the some of the comments. So we talked about the opioids. So oxy, we talked about chasing the bean, smoking them on the piece of foil, 
There's codeine, which they drink in syrup. That's that lean, that perp that we talked about. Um, you can also just take pills, any pill, like Percocets and whatever. You can just take those pills. But like I said, it gets expensive. And eventually people will be injecting heroin. That's what it comes down to. But then there's cocaine. I'm not going to lie. Like co Cocaine's a party drug. And it's kind of a rich party drug. It's like for people with money. You're not, you don't know many cocaine addicts that aren't wealthy. You know what I mean? Typically, they they bump the coke, they go right to crack. In Hawaii, we call it ma. So I saw tons of crack. And and crack, I get this question all the time: What's the difference between coke and crack? Like, what is that whole thing? Well, I don't know if you guys remember before the '80s epidemic, crack epidemic in the '80s. There used to be cocaine, just cocaine. And people used to freebase it. It was called freebasing cocaine. So basically how that works. Cocaine is a hydrochloride and an alkaloid. And they call that a base. It's a chemical property, being a base. It can be an acid or a base. This is a base. Well, the problem with that is that you can't heat and smoke cocaine because it's a base. So you can't smoke it. So one thing that people would do when they wanted to smoke it is they would have to remove the, hydrochlor the hydrochloride. So they would basically pour ether on it, which we all know ether is like an explosive, flammable chemical. They'd, they'd pour ether over the Coke and it would strip the hydrochloride out of the Coke. And all it would leave was the, um, what's it called? Alkaloid. And then they could smoke it. So it was a base and you would free the base by pouring ether on it. But people were like blowing up and catching themselves on fire. So it was hard to free base. Remember, that's why, what's his name? Who's that comedian? Um, not, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. The black comedian in the 70s and 80s. Richard Pryor. I, mean, I don't know if you guys remember, back then he blew up his face. He had like burns all over his face. He was free basing coke. Caught himself on fire. So when people started figuring out how to make crack... It was so much easier because you could use baking soda. What is baking soda? I forget what it's called. Um, whatever the property is in baking soda. Soda by uh, carbonate, by sodium, car sodium carbonate. You could pour baking soda in with the Coke and it will strip the hydrochloride that way. Then you heat it up and it would crack. So when you heated the, the base cocaine, it would crack. That's why they called it crack. So that's the difference is you can smoke crack. You cannot smoke cocaine. You have to snort cocaine, which goes into your bloodstream, but it doesn't last as long. And then you could hit crack. You could smoke crack and your lungs would take it up. So that's basically the difference for anybody who's wondering. We call crack ma'a in Hawaii. And ma'a, I, I found most of mine down the bottom Mauna Kea and Kekalike. So Kekalike Mall, the bottom of Kekalike, down by Nimitz, and down at the bottom of Mauna Kea, past King Street, Makai of King Street. And it was like, that was like the crack zone. And for whatever reason, it was mostly African Americans that were smoking crack on Mauna Kea. And people that smoked crack didn't smoke ice. There wasn't like somebody who smoked Batu and crack. It was like one or the other. It was like teens. They, they just smoked ice and they just smoked ma. Eventually, I think people smoke whatever just to get something. But for the most part, people who smoke crack didn't like ma. People that smoke or people that smoke batu didn't smoke ma. It's just how it was. I, I I would ask them all the time and they just would say they didn't like the high, they didn't like the rush, whatever. PJ Tanag with the fifteen dollar gift. Thank you, PJ. You've done that before, man. Thank you so much. You're super generous, bro. I appreciate you. That's awesome, man. Thank you, sir. That's a blessing. You guys don't have to do that. You know, I'm just coming to hang out with you guys. I think this is fun. I don't know if you like it or not, but I like talking about Hawaii issues. I like talking about the things that I learned on patrol. So I just, it's an honor to me that you guys came out here and want to hang out. And I can't imagine someone would want to hear my voice this long, but I do appreciate you guys kicking it. And you guys get to hang out with each other. So I appreciate you. The Oni 96789 sodium bicarbonate. There you go. Jordy says, crack is whack. Straight up. <laughs> Appreciate you, Georgie. Sleep time's over show. Go check them out. 
They've been supporting the channel, coming and visiting. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Um, so after we talked about cocaine, oh, you got Adderall, people doing Adderall. That's a big one, but that's growing amongst like the college crowd. Adderall will keep you up. It can focus. It's for people with ADD, they would give them for hyper focus, but people are smoking Adderall and snorting Adderall and just taking Adderall. That's a big one. That's probably one of the faster growing ones, but you see a lot of attorneys doing it. A lot of like business people do it. Sales people do it, but you don't really see that too much on the street for the most part. People that are doing Adderall still live with their parents or are out in college and or just are like young and just started their jobs for the most part. You're going to get people doing Adderall because people will do any drug, but it's not something I saw on the street very much. I did make a few Adderall arrests. I'd arrest them for other drugs. They'd have like Batu or whatever, and then you'd find Adderall and we'd have to identify it, call poison control. They'd tell me what it is and then I'd write up the case. So we went through Coke. Um, we went through opioids. Okay, let's get into meth because this is what everybody, this is like the big one. This is the one that if I were to sum up Hawaii's problems, it's crystal methamphetamine or what we call Batu. It's just like the worst thing and it hit Hawaii more. It's Hawaii is easily the meth capital of the United States. I know that every once in a while, like Colorado or these different states would have their own issues with it, but it doesn't come close. Hawaii, overall, it, it's easily the biggest problem per capita with crystal meth. Is it because it hit Hawaii first? Maybe. I mean, I, that, that doesn't just seem like a coincidence. It probably has something to do with it, but I bet you island culture is more susceptible. You know what I mean? And... It's harder to get help when you're in an island culture for longer. But then once it got here, like now there's places for people to get help, but there was so long where people didn't have help and it was underground and people didn't know what was happening. Um, a lot of people in Hawaii, I'm sure most of you guys in my chat right now on TikTok and on YouTube, there's about a hundred of you total. Most of you have either experienced meth yourselves or family members or have been directly um, affected by crystal meth use, especially in Hawaii. Um, but for those of you who don't know, I will leave links in the description of the videos on YouTube that meth is incredibly addictive. Some would say the most addictive drug that you can be a, that you can take. For most drugs, we know that the first use doesn't create an addiction. But with meth, we know that it can. We know that people do get addicted by just doing it once. And that's because of how it works. That's because of how crystal meth actually works, which is so much different than other drugs. It is similar to crack, but there's one major difference that I'm going to get into, and that's why meth is so dangerous. Let me give you a little breakdown that I have here. Again, I'm going to leave some links in the description of the YouTube video. But the rush of dopamine that's created by crystal meth is what makes it special. There's some things that happen in the synapse of your cells. So dopamine is a chemical that is responsible for inducing feelings of pleasure. That's like the pleasure center. Pleasure is our body's reward program. So... How our, how our body works is it rewards you for certain things to encourage you to do them. That's why food tastes good because you need to eat. You know what I mean? And that's why, they're, that's why breathing feels so good because your body wants you to do it. That's why touching something hot burns. It's your body saying no. So we have like this reward center in our brain. That's where dopamine functions. Dopamine means the chemical that your body creates. But it's not just for pleasure. It's for motivation because we learn by pleasure. That's how like Pavlov's dogs, you ring a bell and give them food and these kind of things. And eventually they would just ring a bell and then they would be drooling because they knew the food was coming. That's what that was dealing with. It was showing how, that, how the brain works. So dopamine encourages and 
motivation for doing certain things. It encourages memory retention. So it literally deals with the memory in the brain. That's what addiction is. And you're basically rewarding your body every time you do something that delivers dopamine or that stimulates the dopamine production in your body. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not giving, this isn't a college course. I'm just giving kind of a breakdown of what I understand. Um, The problem is that the crystal meth, the rush with crystal meth is so much greater than other drugs. It's not even fair. It's It's on a different level. And all these drugs give you more dopamine rush than your typical dopamine produced in the brain for a natural experience. So you know how like some people are adrenaline junkies, right? You like jump Waimea Rock or you want to go jump off waterfalls or you want to jump out of airplanes. You like diving, um, things that are dangerous you'd like to do. That Those create like these this dopamine rush for you. And so when you have a baby and you see your baby for the first time and like there's all this dopamine that comes out of you and is released in the brain. <sighs> What's happening there is the pure pleasure that you would get from like waking up and drinking a cup of coffee and watching the sunrise or someone giving you a compliment. Those things all create, all activate the dopamine centers in the brain. The thing is like your body is used to those dopamine peaks. And when you smoke meth or do most drugs, you get a dopamine rush. The thing with meth is it's so much greater than the natural rush that you would get. And that becomes problematic. And I will leave a link to those studies um, from drugabuse.gov for those of you that want to look into it more. But um, there is a video out there that I'm going to leave a a link to that basically explains it. It just shows the brain. Um, I wonder if I can throw it in the chat right now. Let me see. I'm going to do that. I'm going to throw it in the chat right now. Of course, it's going to tell me that I got to sign in. Here it is. So I'm leaving one in the chat right now. If you guys want to click it, you will see what I mean. Um, and I'll be. I'm basically going to. I'm basically going to read what they talk about in the site. It says, deep within the brain is a set of structures called the limbic system. The limbic system contains the brain's reward circuit or pathway. The reward circuit links together a number of brain structures that control and regulate our ability to feel pleasure. Feeling pleasure motivates us to repeat behaviors. When the reward circuit is activated, each individual cell in that circuit relays electrical and chemical signals. There's a small gap between the sending and receiving cells called the synapse. In the reward circuit, dopamine neurons release the neurotransmitter dopamine. They travel across the synapse and link up with proteins called dopamine receptors on the surface of a receiving cell. When the dopamine binds to the exterior of the dopamine receptor, this causes proteins attached to the interior part of the receptors to carry the signal onward. So what happens is you smoke ice, your body releases dopamine, there's this little gap called a synapse. So the body will release the dopamine. The dopamine will float and get picked up by the dopamine receptor. When it sticks inside this dopamine receptor, you have pleasure, essentially like the pleasure chemicals. It travels down to the rest of the body, which is like that feeling that you get. So it starts here, travels to here, and then spreads, carries on for the rest of the body. Well, what happens normally is you do something awesome, like you have a baby or you get someone smiles at you or you get a compliment, right? Some of this dopamine comes out and then comes in and you feel that pleasure. Well, when you smoke ice, this gets flooded with dopamine, like 10 times the dopamine that you would normally get from something that's supposed to give you pleasure, like eating or whatever. Well, some of these dopamine receptors, they reach here, you feel that pleasure. Some of them go back up and get more dopamine just a few of them. Well, when you flood this place with all the dopamine receptor, when you flood it with all this dopamine, it's just dopamine everywhere. You get this constant rush. And some people can get like eight hours. Like it's crazy. But for the most part, it's like 30 minutes, depending on how much you smoke and depending on how you do it, depending on how fast, like there's different ways you can do it. If you say inject your ice, it's right in your bloodstream. So it's a faster rush. You get all those, all that dopamine in that center. Whereas if you smoke it, it's a little bit longer lasting, not as intense. Um, 
so that's basically how that works. Um, where was I at? So it says, drugs are able to hijack this process, contributing to unhealthy behaviors and consequences. When someone first uses meth, the drug quickly enters the brain. At low doses, meth blocks the re-entry of dopamine into the presynaptic cell, just like cocaine. But unlike cocaine, higher doses of meth can increase the release of dopamine from the cell, leading to too much dopamine in the synapse, where it becomes trapped, since meth presents transporters for removing it. So check this out. So once the dopamine is created and floats around in here, it's supposed to get picked up by these dopamine receptors and then spread through the body. But what happens is some of them will get stuck and it will block the uptake. So the, the dopamine will build up in here. So it literally like blows out your dopamine receptors and blows out what creates the dopamine. So it's like a lifetime's worth of dopamine. So you'll go through twice the dopamine as a normal person or 100 times the dopamine as a normal person if you're using drugs. The body's not made to release that much dopamine at that that small amount of a time. So people who think that doing ice is that you can recover from smoking ice, it depends on how much damage it's done. Sometimes it's done too much damage. We know that there's long-term effects that you never overcome if you've done it a certain amount of time, if it's done certain damage to your dopamine receptors. One thing that I've heard from a lot of people that smoke ice is that the normal things that used to make you, that give you that feeling of euphoria, like jumping out of a plane or maybe like falling in love or those things, they don't do it anymore because your body is now used to all that dopamine, whereas it's never going to hold a candle to it. Way too much dopamine when you're smoking meth. I've heard homeless people tell me it's like an orgasm for 30 minutes. So, watching a sunrise doesn't stand a chance to a 30-minute orgasm. That's how powerful it is. And of course, your body adapts, and then you need more to get high. Pretty soon, you're doing it all. Normally, people start out smoking it. They put it in a pipe. It has a little... It's a, we call it a clear glass cylindrical object with a bulbous end. So it'd be like a round ball at the end. There's usually a hole at the top and you'll drop the ice inside the pipe. It'll roll down into that bulb at the bottom and then you heat it up and you smoke it. When it starts to smoke, you inhale. Well, eventually you want more and more and more and you're getting broke because you're spending all your money. So instead of smoking it, you inject it. And it's my experience that people who inject ice or slam, we call it slamming, people who slam ice, they've almost all smoked it and it just wasn't enough for them anymore. And by that time, if you're slamming ice, you're gone. The damage is done. I, I don't... Whenever I would meet somebody who is slamming drugs... I mean, they're at the, they're at the bottom end of it. Like the chances that they're going to die are so much greater than the people that are smoking ice. So it's pretty gnarly, the advancement, how you can just go from smoking something. Cause think about how serious you got to be about a drug to slam it. You really got to need it cause nobody likes needles. And then when you can't slam it in that vein anymore, cause you blew out the vein cause of all the scar tissue. I mean, think about how bad you got to want something to stick it in your vein like that. I mean, that's... Some experts say that there's up to 120,000 meth users in Hawaii. Think about that, because there's only like 1.2 million people in Hawaii. That's like 10 or 12% of people. Now, they didn't say meth addicts, they just said people who use meth. Could be recreationally or whatever, but 120,000, some experts say. I imagine that's a, there's no way to really tell, right? Because not everybody's telling you if they're doing meth. But I do know that in 2018, 35% of all men brought into the jails had meth in their system. Bro, that's three and a half out of 10 people have meth in their system when they go to jail. How many more people smoke meth but just never had it in their system when they went to jail? 
right? And that would support what I've found from my experience as a police officer. So it makes sense. Almost nobody was arrested by me who was not smoking ice. And almost everyone I picked up on warrants were on the run. And we have drug court. Hawaii had drug court. And drug court was a court for people that just were in trouble for drugs. It wasn't violent crimes or whatever. Drug courts for people that just had drug cases. And eventually we got the Hope Probation Program, which had mostly to do with crystal meth. But eventually it spread to other crimes. And the HOPE program, once you get arrested, you get released whenever you do some time, you get released on probation, but HOPE is graduated. So the first time you get, first time you violate with whether or not calling in and checking your colors, they call it. So on HOPE probation, you get assigned a color. You have to call in every single day to probation officer. It's like a message board or whatever. It's like a voicemail. And they'll say, today is color yellow. And so if your color yellow and you called in and the answer machine said today's yellow, you got to go in and drug test. You got to do random drug tests. If you and when you don't go in it's called missing your colors. Everybody who missed their colors uh, they knew what that meant. And I remember I didn't know what it meant the first time I heard it. Like some dudes I I I'd, I'd stop them and they say, "Hey officer." I say, "What's your name?" They give me a fake name or whatever. I tell them, "Hey, you lying to me." I know officers, I miss my colors. I remember not knowing what that was, but you don't want to act like you don't know. So I was like, oh, you missed your colors. And I just, I never knew what they were talking about. But eventually, after hearing it a few times and talking to people, people explained to me what they had to do. And you basically call in and find out if it's your color that day. If it's your color, you got to go test. If you don't test, you miss your, you violate. Now you go in. Once you go in, let's say you go in for two weeks. The first one is like a slap on the wrist, like two weeks. And then you do your two weeks, you get back out. If you violate again, now it's not two weeks, it's two months. You go on for two months. And then you get out. And if you violate a third time, it's like, whatever. A bigger graduated scale. That's what whole probation was. It was that there was immediate action. You immediately get caught. You go in when you violate and you do a certain amount of time. If you get caught again, you go in. It's supposed to be like immediate action and graduated in severity. Okay. Just want to check some TikTok comments. Crack is a real issue, almost as bad as ice. Crack users tend to be able to function a lot better, like holding a job and being more functional. Ice, on the other hand, eight out of ten times will strip you of everything. I agree, Elijah. Um, crack. Crack is not a big as big of an epidemic. We know that in Hawaii. Maybe globally, but not in Hawaii. Hawaii meth is the king. Um, and you're right. I think that meth takes more from you. But I think it's because it's more intense. And it has a greater addiction. And it's a faster addiction than crack. Um, Bratakamu. Drugs is junk. No good. I thought it was the best thing, but no wrong. It ain't good at all. Right on, Bratakamu. Which is worth heroin or meth? Which is worth, which is worse, heroin or meth? Isn't one just the other times ten? No, heroin is a different high. Heroin is an opiate. Heroin is like a calming. Um, you can't even call it a high. It's more like a low. People do call it a high, but it does different stuff to the body. Whereas meth is an upper meth, an amphetamine. It doesn't calm you like heroin. Like when you see somebody, I've seen people slam heroin. Like I've come around a corner and watched them inject the needle. And then you watch what happens to their eyes roll. They like kind of melt and fall back and they go into this thing. It's like, it's like uh, when you're having surgery and they're going to give you anesthesia. It's that kind of vibe. Whereas meth, they hit the meth and it's like this rush, like woo, when it's like energy and all they're hyper. And it, they can be hyper focused though. It doesn't have to be like bouncing off walls, but they have. It gives them energy. It a meth will decrease your appetite. You won't eat for three days, and you might clean your whole house. Tons of people will just go on like 
will clean the whole house because of, because of um, meth. Um, a rush from injection of meth produces the strongest effects and can last up to 30 minutes. After the initial rush, people use people using the drug experience a steady high that can last anywhere from 8 to 24 hours depending on the mode of consumption. Injecting meth produces a stronger high than smoking or snorting, but the effects wear off quickly. Meth users are known to stay up for multiple days in a row due to binge use and the stimulating effects. So there you go. Links to some of these studies that I put in here. Oh, let me give you a quick breakdown. Meth hit the islands in the 80s at the same time it hit the rest of the country. Many experts believe it hit Hawaii first and then made it to the mainland. The fine, check this guy, check this out, guys. The final toll on the state of Hawaii due to meth abuse in 2018 came in at $500 million. That's half a billion. $500 million is the financial toll. And here's why. These costs accrue in the form of incarceration of drug offenders. So, because as taxpayers, we pay for the incarceration of drug offenders. Foster care for the children of the, mat, the meth addicts. Lost employee productivity due to addicts losing their jobs. Needed health care services for physically debilitating meth users. And the treatment of addicts through rehab centers. $500 million. Not just from taxpayers, but as a whole. The prevalence of meth use in Hawaii is astronomical. Positive drug tests for meth in Hawaiian workforce is 410% greater than the national average. 410% greater. Than the national average. That's how big of a problem it is in Hawaii. Furthermore, no less than 90% of all federally sentenced drug cases in Hawaii involve meth. 90% of all federally sentenced drug cases in Hawaii involve meth. That's like, picture this, out of 10 fed cases, one of them was Catherine K. Law. The rest of them were Mike Miskey. 90% involve meth. 9 out of 10. That's crazy. Um, meth is also closely connected to violent crime in Hawaii and theft. Much of the violence and theft that occurs in Hawaii is because of meth addicts stealing or committing violence in order to get more meth. And so I have a link that I will put right now in the chat. So you guys can see them. A meth user very often loses the ability to enjoy life if she or he is not high. Periods off the drug may be spent sleeping or simply trying to get more drugs. I can't tell you how many times, dude. You just I'd see people three nights in a row walking around. Three nights in a row looking for more meth. Or just being crazy. And then all of a sudden they disappear for three days. And when I'd see them again, I said, where you been? Be like, I've been sleeping for three days. Because they just like stay up for three days, no sleep. Walking all over the place. There are such severe chances, there are such severe changes to the brain after meth use that many meth users are not able to feel pleasure when they are not using meth. This is one of the ways that drugs lock the addict in the habit. So check us out. You start you you fall into a meth addiction. And we talked about how it works with the dopamine receptors, right? Well, you're, you get so used to the dopamine and the synapse being full of dopamine that you, when you're not, when the dopamine isn't in that synapse, you can't feel pleasure. So I had a lot of the chronics that I talked with said sex didn't feel good when they weren't on meth. Seeing their baby that they love didn't feel good when they're on meth. It was hard to make physical connection with people, like hugging people. And you know when you hug somebody, you feel that love? They couldn't feel that anymore when they weren't high. So to feel that and feel normal, they would have to pump dopamine by getting high. So they smoke meth, and then those things felt good. So smoking meth, then having sex. Smoking meth, then, you know, doing something that you have fun doing. So you can't actually have pleasure without having the meth in the system. That's what locks them in because they don't feel human anymore. The only way they can feel normal is by doing the drug and then going and living their life. And that's how they get locked in. And meth is literally stronger than crack or any other drug. So it's just magnified with them. Um, 
it says uh, the over time Math Matthews can result in Parkinson's disease like symptoms mentally a person may develop symptoms similar to schizophrenia which we've all seen that right we've all seen the chronic who's like schizophrenic now so oftentimes in the videos that I post or in social media videos people will always comment like hey um, that person's not just a chronic what if they're mentally ill but for a police officer that dealt with that kind of stuff or anyone in like the medical field like working at Queens or Straub or whatever in a, in a trauma unit they tell you sometimes yeah it is mental illness but they're only mentally ill because of the years of doing crystal meth they did meth for so long it just changed who they were now they're schizophrenic and once you have that mental illness, like, I don't know if there's anything coming back from that. Like schizophrenia? I don't know if people come back from schizophrenia. So now you're schizophrenic the rest of your life, even if you stop doing drugs, because the damage was done. Okay, uh, let me see what we got here on TikTok. Make that bag said two completely different drugs, correct? It depends everybody's different that meth high is so incredibly high that you immediately need to get more to get the same high heroin actually makes you have a physical addiction and withdrawal yeah withdrawal is strong with heroin for sure but heroin was too good in my opinion dangerous oh for sure I could never do either one or I'd be hooked make that back said mean to dopamine Hawaii boys downfall is life downfall in life is math bought to you right Josh and Zay's dad what's up thanks for coming through bro the walking dead that's exactly what it is I think that that's probably the best way to describe what the meth epidemic is like in Hawaii. It would be as if, let's say there are 2,000 meth users in Hawaii. That Remember, the estimates are up to 120,000, but let's say chronics. Let's say 20,000 chronics in Hawaii. It's literally like the walking dead. If 20,000 of the walking dead, the, the night whatever walkers, whatever they're called, if they just showed up and walked through the streets, that's how it looks at nighttime. We've all seen them in Chinatown, the dudes that just walk. We've seen them on videos on Hawaii, Hawaii Viral and all those were like some chronic just walking around getting nuts. That's what it's like, dude. They're not, they're not right anymore. And there's no coming back from that. Thanks, Georgie. Brought a comic. Did it for five years. Now no more. Congratulations, dude. Make that back. Said, yeah, you come on. That's amazing. Okay, I'm all caught up there. Sorry, guys, on YouTube. I'm going to catch up with you guys right now. It's kind of going off. Whoa, man. So much. BT said, what do you do for a living now? A few things right now, but I'm a builder. I build homes and a few things. Changes are coming. Too bad we couldn't do a virtual group chat and we could all see each other and talk story. We're going to do that. Um, actually, I'm going to start. I'm going to try with my book club with the Sunny Sky Shady Characters. We're going to do that in about a week or probably 10 days, something like that. Because, and this is um, high three that asked this question. We're actually going to do that, but we're, I got to start with a smaller group to figure out how this is going to work. Cause right now there's hundred people in the chat and I can't, there's no way you could do hundred, but with our, I mean, you can, I'm pretty sure you can, but there's no way you would see everybody and you got to be able to control like who's in it. Right. Um, cause not everybody wants to be seen. Some people would just want to watch. Right. So, we're going we're gonna to start it in the book club. We're going to do a Zoom meeting with everybody or a Google Meet, some, one of those two. Whatever works out best for everybody in this, we can all talk and, tell, and talk story. I mean, that's kind of the, group, that's kind of the idea. Uh, 
Jovan says, nobody smokes crack anymore. Played out. 1990s was the last of that. And I will say this. I, I mean, obviously, that's not true. People still smoke crack. But I don't see new crack smokers. So when I was in Oahu, I didn't find people that had recently started smoking crack. Most people start smoking ice. The people that smoke crack smoke crack a long time. Matter of fact, I arrested one dude from Detroit who was a crack, a crack dealer in Chinatown. I remember him telling me he was from Detroit and he was right from the same neighborhood that I was from, within like a mile. And they were all down Mauna Kea and Kekalike area. And that was just, it was like the crack block. Everybody down there was smoking crack in that little spot. But I'm telling you, every time I busted a drug dealer, they had Batu and heroin and crack. So for them to have all three was serious. Chinatown's loaded with heroin. Most of your heroin is going to be River Street. So River Street north of... Definitely north of King. North of Hotel. So basically River Street has that little mall that runs all the way down by the Chinese cultural area. And everything north of Hotel was all heroin. Everyone would sit down on the side, so on the on the Cocoa Head side of Nuwanu Stream. Everybody laying on the sidewalk by all those buildings, all the way up to Vineyard. That's all heroin. So it's just think hotel to Vineyard on River Street. That's heroin. And Mauna Kea, Kekalike, from King Street down to Nimitz. That was all crack. Everywhere else was bought. Every everywhere else was ice in Chinatown for whatever reason because I think you you kind of flocked to the people who did the drug that you did in case you needed to bump some drugs or you just being around it all the time that's what the dealers knew to stop by there was this dealer in Chinatown that we called door to door Mike they call him door to door that's all they'd say where's door to door and I remember once I wanted him to snitch I wanted him to give me some some info because I knew he was dealing but I didn't have proof I knew he was hustling. I started running into him. And I was hearing from all the guys I was talking to that they were getting their drugs from door to door. And he always had them fanny pack. But his warrants, I had stopped them a few times for some warrant, but the warrant was always old. They just never pulled it out of the system. And it was getting annoying because you'd stop them, run them. He'd have, a, he'd have a warrant. You'd go to confirm the warrant. And they'd say, no more warrant. Sheriffs couldn't find the warrant or whatever. So it was just a warrant that never got cleared out of the system. So I could never hook him up for the heroin. But had kids dying. I don't know if it was fentanyl or whatever was in them. But um, his own heroin, the people that he, he supplied drugs for ended up lumping him up one day. I remember seeing them all worked. He used to drive around on a moped and a bike. He was from New York. And he used to wear bike gloves. That's how I that's how I recognized him the first few times. He always had those black gloves on, like with the fingers showing. He always had those had those on. He used to wear his fanny pack across the front right here and just ride his bike through Chinatown all hours of the night. He had a New York accent. He was super easygoing, easy to talk to with police, so that's like red flag right away. Um, and he was given he was supplying all the heroin. Door to door Mike, they called him. I know his real name. I'm not going to say it, but they all called him door to door. They never knew him. They never knew what his last name was. Shrooms. How would you guys handle that in HPD? Yeah, no. Um, I maybe remember one or two shrooms cases in my whole career, and I never handled them, so I don't know to be honest with you. Because you got to be able to test them, and you got to be able to tell that they're not just regular mushrooms. Right, because you got to have training and experience that they are the magic mushrooms, basically. Otherwise, a dude could just say, yo, it's not illegal to have mushrooms, and there goes the case. But if you have training, you knew what kind of mushrooms it was, or an utterance, if they told you that's magic mushrooms, like that's a drug, then you might have something. 
And if you stay awake for more than three days in a row, your brain will fry. Got to force yourself to sleep. Yeah, that makes sense. It's so cheap and lasts so long. The hair on the back of your neck stand up from the first hit. Food has no taste when you're on about to. No ways. Aaron Stevens says, rehab is tougher to, in a small community due to running into old user friends and dealers. There you go, Aaron. That's a good point, bro. That is a good point. You know how it is. It's hard to get out the loop when you keep running into dudes. Like it's like a trigger or some old girlfriend or old boyfriend or whatever. You run into these people. And then they're trying to be friends, right? And they want to kick it. So they're like, yo, you, yo, you want some? Like even if you're not looking for it. They're like, yo, I got whatever. You're right, Aaron. Worst part is Polynesians rub them right back in other Polynesians' faces. Fa fancy, flashy toys thanks to other Polynesians you made chronic. Yeah, it's sad, right, when communities, like, sell drugs to their own communities. And Polynesians are so family-oriented. You know what I mean? So if you work in that angle, you're exploiting your own people. I've seen that. That's what messed me up with the whole um, board of directors with the Bishop of State, which we're going to get into in the book. Don't forget, we started. We have not done our first. We have not done our first video about chapter one and chapter two. So if you guys want to check it out, all we did was an intro this week, where I gave a history of organized crime, and the video is private just for the patrons, um, so that you guys aren't getting flooded with videos that you don't want to see. But if you want to go through it with us, we start this Monday will be the first video where we discuss chapters one and two. So if you've read it already, cool. If not, you can buy it. You can find the link in the description. Go on my link tree. There's a link to where you can get it. Um, I have not tried it. I have not tried. I have not done any drug but marijuana. And then I'm pretty sure I smoked a joint that had opium in them when I was like 16 but I didn't know that's what I was doing I remember it just smelled really sweet it smelled really 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 sweet and I remember asking what is it and he said it had opium in it but I don't know if it did or not that's just what he said Jovan Lopez yo Doug about the casino thing can Hawaiian natives on Hawaiian native lands can they open up casinos like the Native Americans do in America and why aren't the Hawaiians pushing for armed security I guess technically they can, Jovan, but they're not classified the same as an American Indian. And I think that's a good thing because I think the American Indian got screwed. The American Indian got pushed onto the reservations. And look at the poorest places in the country are Indian reservations. And I think the Hawaiian people have a better chance at, at sovereignty than the, Amer the Native American population. Native American population... <sighs> It's kind of a harder case and it makes you feel really bad it's really sad because the native hawaiians have a distinct advantage in my opinion over the native american situation and i'm not a i'm not a you know i'm not an expert at this but a good friend of mine and my pastor when i was in hawaii he's um He's a very active member in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. And he's, I've, I've sat for hours discussing it with him. And obviously I've done my own research, but um, Hawaii, the native Hawaiians, Hawaii before annexation was basically living off this document. The American control of the Hawaiian islands was only temporary. And it says in the paperwork, until such time that the Hawaiian people can raise up a government sufficient to support themselves. Now, the American government exploited that, and then eventually Hawaii was annexed to the states. But it's still that, we still have that document. Like, it's still a real thing. It's not just that they were taken over and America admitted to taking them over. Like, we actually had a contract. So there's actually standing in court. And so I hope that the Hawaiian people, hope that the Hawaiian sovereign groups don't settle for reservation status like the Native Americans are. The Native Americans didn't settle. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, I hope that they don't settle for what the U.S. government gave the Native American Indian, which is brutally sad. One of the saddest things I've ever heard of. 
It's just that the native Hawaiian people don't have to go that route. I think they have more of, it's just going to be a, a, a taller mountain to climb for the native American than it would be for the native Hawaiian because of the contracts that we have. Um, we'll get into, we'll do videos on that. And I would love to hear what everybody has to say about it. Cause I think that's something that has to be talked about, but I'll get into that into another video. That's a whole nother video. Uh, high three said Las Vegas will never allow Hawaii to have a casino. I agree. I don't think they will. The Hawaiian politics is corrupt. Roger that. Um, the down from Batu was so bad. Straight up quit cold Turkey. No ways. MJ said that the down from Batu was so bad. So after you came off Batu, it was so bad that quit cold turkey. High 3 said Las Vegas would lose too much revenue if Hawaii opened casinos, let alone opening them on Oahu. That island going sink, Bombay. Yeah. That's why Vegas caters to the Hawaiian. That's why Vegas has Hawaiian hotels, Hawaiian foods. The Ninth Island. Have you ever arrested someone famous? You know, I didn't do the arrest. I think I didn't want to, you know. Someone else on scene did the arrest because I didn't want to end up on the news. What's the guy from Hawaii Five-O um, and Lost? Day Kim. I forget his name. I think I was there when he got arrested. Um, there's one thing I did want to say. One of the side effects to the, the drug use problem, especially intravenous in Hawaii, is this, that, which I found was pretty crazy. In 2017, had three thirty eight thousand two hundred and twenty six new cases of HIV in the United States. So 38,226 in the U.S. 10% were from intravenous drug use. Of those, 78 were in Hawaii. So in 2017, 78 people got HIV on the island in Hawaii and all the islands. In 2017, 2,524 people we're living with HIV in Hawaii. So 78 new cases, but 2,524. 2,524 people have HIV in Hawaii. 6,700 live with hepatitis C. That's only in Hawaii. 31, sorry. 2,524 with HIV, 6,700 with Hep C. That's almost 10,000 people with a disease that will kill them if they don't take drugs. That's insane, yeah. What's crazy? Smoke meat, not drugs. I love that one. That's a good one. I'm going to make a shirt with that. There probably already is one. Smoke Aku, not Batu. Roger, Nathan. <laughs> what is... Does it say 50? Toffee Sal, $50. No ways. Toffee, that's so much money. I know how much money that is. You didn't have to do that, sir. I thank you so much. That's the most everybody anybody's ever given. I thought I was seeing that weird. Fifty dollars, man, that's huge. Thank you, Tuffy. I appreciate you, Mahalos, bro. And Kingston's Pride with another twenty dollar gift, man. Thank you, Kingston's Pride. I don't wanna. That's awesome, man. And that's not the first time. Thank you. I. It doesn't go unnoticed, man. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, my auntie calls it an incense burner. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so somebody somebody mentioned the pipe. Oh, where was that? I seen the pipe comment. I wanted to read about that. I used to make Batu pipes out of glass car air fresheners. No way. Glass car air fresheners. So, um, you can buy the beaker glass pipe. You can just buy them in bulk. And there was this one girl. She was a Japanese lady. And they, they just called her Auntie. That's all they called her, Auntie. She used to make the pipes and sell them. That's how she made her money. She used to live at a tent. I don't know if you guys remember this, but Tent Alawana Boulevard and Atkinson. So Atkinson and Alamoana, right where it met, right by the entrance to Alamoana Beach Park. You, it has the double crosswalk. You got to cross the Mauka side, you know, the, the Eva bound lanes, and then it get one place in the in the center. And then you have to cross the Cocoa Head bound lanes. Well, she used to post up in the middle because it was a weird thing where it wasn't in the park, but it was on the sidewalk. So she got away with it for like months. And she would sleep in a tent there and she would just cut the pipe. She'd heat them, cut them, and then heat it up. And like, she was like a glass blower, and she was just making pipes. Hundreds of pipes. I've seen boxes of hundreds of pipes. And it's not illegal to have one pipe by itself or have a hundred pipes by themselves. It's only illegal. So you could catch a paraphernalia charge. So how it works in Honolulu is you have crystal meth. That's a, that's a C felony. And... In any amount for possession of crystal meth. But if it's in a pipe, that pipe is considered paraphernalia. And that's an additional charge to the drugs. But if it's if there's no more drugs, then that pipe is not illegal. So it can only be added on to the charge. And she used to make hundreds of them and sell them. And I think what she'd do, you know, is to get ice, she'd give pipes to people and they'd give her ice. Because they'd have ice but nothing to smoke them in. And she'd give him a pipe and they'd give her some drugs. That's probably how it worked. Okay. I thought the guy in the park by my house was doing Tai Chi poses. Came to find out he was just high on heroin. Bro, I've seen people uh, high on heroin in their car, foot on the brake. But they're stuck, so their foot was on the brake. But if they took that foot off the brake, they, you know what I mean? Right in front of the pagoda, I caught one girl smoking Oxy. And she was a dental assistant. Dental assistant, bro. I think she was stealing them from... She had all the trails. They call them snail tails or something like that. And it would be like little snail... Like black snail marks. You can always tell because the piece of a, that square piece of foil and it has a bunch of black trails on it from when they were tilting it to watch the, the pill melt away and that's how you can tell so if you if, if you know if if your kids or whatever if you see foil with a bunch of like black lines on it that's them smoking pills hi three i live in vegas i'll be back on oahu in the ending of june for fourth of july week roger should be fun um sounded tough when campaigning now he sounds soft yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen him. I only heard. It's been a long time. Uh, he came to my recruit class and talked to us about hope. And then once I seen him at Costco with my family and I talked to him. That hope probation program spread across the country. It's like getting big. Okay. All right, guys. I'm going to have to wrap this up. I've been going like hour half already Let's see if I can't get to anything my younger brother's homeless addict living down Sherwoods breaks my heart my brother's a good person chooses that life I pray for him all the time man Nons I'm sorry that's hard to have a brother homeless addict that's sad I wish I was there. I could try help any way I could, but 
That's sad. You guys are super active on the chat, man. I appreciate, I appreciate all that. Cook rice, not ice, brother Kamal. Sub always can. Okay. Oh, Shatigny, what's up, bro? No joke, I found a photo in my old photos with your name on them from a tag that you wrote, Shatigny. I was going through my old photos for a video that I'm making, and I stopped somebody that had already been tagged, and I took a photo of the tag for my own reference, had your name on them. I said, no way. It was literally the last time I did a video that you checked in. So it was just a trip. Do you remember me? Because we worked together a few times. Dang, I got a bunch. I got a reunion going on in the chat. Kim, you went Castle? Oh, snap. Oh, eight. Oh, snap. 91. LOL. Oh, wait. Shoot. You're way younger than me. How do I know you? 2,000 in the house. Wow. I'm so glad you guys could connect. Pipes, easy to make. Take less than five minutes. Yep. Pyrex tubes. But the glass car air freshener is easy to get at longs. I see. That's why. That makes more sense. I still don't even know what that looks like. I'm going to Google one and see what it looks like. I work in hospice, Cam T says. Tired of having 30 to 40 year old par patients due to meth. Yeah, that's sad. Painkillers don't care who you are. Yeah. Kai says, I've seen my coworker make a pipe. What's the youngest age I had to arrest? I arrested a 13 year old. Yeah, that was sad. Um, Micronesian girl, 13. She had vodka. She had a gallon of vodka and uh, Country Time Lemonade. You know the um, tub of Country Time Lemonade that screw off the top and it has the sugar in it already? You know, not the one you got to mix. Like this is a pre-mix with sugar and everything. And she was just, I, she was scooping the lemonade in her mouth and then drinking the vodka and she was 13. And she was with three or four other people that had been fighting and, and beat up some kid and there was blood everywhere. So I had to take them in. Because what if they died? You know what I mean? What if she, 13 years old, you kill yourself in vodka real fast. So I took them all in because their parents didn't know where they were at or maybe they did and didn't care. But I remember taking them and that was sad. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, BT says, any plans to come back to visit? I'm thinking about setting up a tour where I, when I when I come out there, whenever COVID lifts and whenever we could do that again, I'm going to come out and probably do a tour, like a crime tour, where um, I could do one where you basically join me on my beat, like what, the route I used to take all through town, all the way from Mayor Rights to basically Punahou. And maybe we do like an all-day thing where we... Uh, we get lunch, but we also like go from one place to the other. And I talk about the things that I saw in these places because I had hot spots that I would check. I had a route every night, depending on what night of the week it was. I'd go s stop at certain spots that I talk about, like those overpasses on the freeway, certain parks. Certain parks had different drug problems. Certain people, if, if I was looking for somebody, I knew what places to check. Um, some of the overpasses, some of the underpasses. I'd go from Dole Park. Or I'd go from Doe Park um, and then make it over to like Kamamalu Playground. And certain places I would find people. But 
Um, in any case, we're going to figure it out. So I'm going to work on that. So we'll see. But any, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys coming through, man. Um, it's a hundred of you that I just had a blast with. So thank you guys. It's been an honor to kick it with you guys again. For my book club people, I'll see you guys Monday night. I might get one more of these out, but we'll see. Um, but either way, I'll see the book club on Monday night. And uh, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for coming through. Thanks for coming through TikTok. Thank you guys on YouTube. I appreciate you.